morning. Ignore the bulletin. I'm kidding. We're not doing that two weeks in a row. Uh, it's good to see you all here this morning. If you're visiting with us, I just want to welcome you once again. And please, please make sure you get a visitor's packet on your way out today. We want to make sure you leave with some information in your hand. We can thank you for being here this morning. One little tiny announcement that got overlooked in the announcement at the beginning. Uh, Brother Chuck Miller does have his camera today, so if you would like to update your photo wall picture or the directory photo, uh, please see him after services. Uh, maybe you've gained the COVID-15, maybe you've lost the COVID-15. Make sure your photo uh, reflects that. Hopefully it's the second one. Anyway, we're going to be in 1 Chronicles, the 13th chapter here this morning, 1 Chronicles 13. Um, this is a text I've been meaning to preach on for a little bit, just trying to find the right time. Um, we're going to be talking about Uzzah and the Ark today. It's one of those texts that there's, there's a lot of lessons here. Really, we want to hone in on the fact of how do we, how do we treat our relationship with God? And how do we approach His Word? How do we treat our relationship with God and how do we approach His Word? You know, in 1 Chronicles 13, what we really have, what it really boils down to is a whole series of shortcuts. Shortcuts that the people took in their service to God and their relationship with Him that had deadly consequences. Most of the time we think short shortcuts are a good thing. Um, I've been told about, since I moved down here, the Phoenix Bypass route on State Route 85. I'm not sure it's a shortcut. <laughs> My GPS map said it added an hour to my trip back from Oregon. Um, but I did find that Loop 202, the one they just completed in Phoenix, that is a shortcut. I don't have to go out of my way, and no one lives on that side of Phoenix, and you bypass that awful, crazy intersection or that, that strip, strip of freeway by uh, ASU, by that Sun Devil Stadium. I don't know what it's called, but it goes from a two-lane highway to eight lanes, and and whenever I get to the airport, you have to like cross four lanes of traffic, and you're just like, good luck, everybody else. I'm, I'm just going to go. Anyway, sometimes shortcuts are, not, are great, especially when it's distance. Other times, they're not great. If you hire contractors in your home, or you're having a home built, and they cut corners, they take shortcuts, you're the one that ends up having to pay for it later. Hopefully, it's nothing serious. Sometimes, it, it, it is. And we're going to see that the little shortcuts that David, and by extension the people by following David, took, had deadly consequences. So let's open to 1 Chronicles 13, looking at the first three verses here. 1 Chronicles 13. This is after David has consolidated his reign as ruler in Israel. He has conquered his enemies. He is now getting ready to consolidate his rule. And part of that, being a man of God, we, we could talk at length of David's time as not king and how faithful he was to Saul and to the Lord. This is part of his character. And so part of that character is he wants to restore the ark. We see here in the first three verses of 1 Chronicles 13, Then David consulted with the captains of the th thousands and hundreds and, even, and ev even with every leader. David said to the, all the assembly of Israel, if it seems good to you, and if it is from the Lord our God, let us send everywhere to our kinsmen who remain in all the land of Israel, also to the priests and the Levites who are with them in their cities with, pasture, with the pasture lands, that they may, may meet with us. And let us bring back the ark of our God to us, for we did not seek it in the days of Saul. David stating up front that what the book of Exodus and Leviticus spent chapters dealing with, the tabernacle, the, the, the Ark of the Covenant, all the, all the regulations and procedures for seeking God in His presence, for the, all that stuff, had kind of been secondary to the reign of Saul. In fact, it's actually underneath the reign of Samuel, the last judge, that the Ark gets stolen. We're going to deal with this in just a minute. And there was no effort on Saul's part, well, we should probably go get the Ark back. The, the, the very thing that symbolizes our covenant with God. Saul could care less. In fact, Saul spent most of his time in paranoia trying to hunt down David at the neglect of the nation. There was a part, part where David's hiding in the wilderness and Saul is seeking him. 
And then he has to stop seeking him because all his armies out here and the Philistines are now in vain. Like, okay, we got to make a U-turn. I got to go fight Philistines. Saul was preoccupied. But David, here we see again, the contrast of character is, no, we need the ark back. We need to bring it back to us. The question is, how do we get to this place? Turn over to 1 Samuel chapter 3. Now, this account we're covering in 1 Chronicles 13 is covered in 2 Samuel, I believe, chapter 9. No, chapter 6, excuse me. Uh, I chose 1 Chronicles 13 because it gives us more detail to work with. Um, They are essentially the same account. The writers have different purposes in how they tell the story. It is the same account. But we're going to go over the background information here, starting in 1 Samuel chapter 3 in verse 21. We see here at the calling of Samuel the prophet. Oh, excuse me. This is after the Philistines have taken the ark of God in battle. And we see here in verse 21, And she called the boy, this is the birth of this boy, Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel because the ark of God was taken and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God was taken. Excuse me. I have a lot of bad Bible reading habits when I preach here. This is one of them. I need to let you know, my comfort blanket of a Bible is not with me today. It's just, the print has gotten too small for me, so I'm preaching from a different Bible. So if it gets a little rocky, that's why. I, I haven't memorized the color locations yet in this one. Anyway, chapter 3, verse 21. Chapter 4, 21 gave you kind of a spoiler of what happens. But in 3, verse 21, we're told that the Lord has returned to Israel. He's now visiting the people. The Lord visited Hannah, and she conceived and gave birth to three sons and two daughters. And the boy Samuel grew before the Lord. So we're told at the end of chapter 3, saying that the Lord had not spoken to Israel for a long time, and now the Lord is speaking to Israel again. And we're getting to see the beginning of calling of Samuel the prophet and last judge. We go to chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. By the way, chapter 3 deals with... um, I did it again. I'm I'm sorry. I read from chapter 2. Chapter 3, 21. The Lord appeared again at Shiloh because the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. First three verses of chapter 4. Thus the word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out to meet the Philistines in battle and camped uh, beside Ebenezer while the Philistines camped at uh, Aphek. And the Philistines drew up in battle array and met to meet Israel. When the battle spread, Israel was defeated before the Philistines who killed about 4,000 men on the battlefield. When the people came into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has the Lord defeated us today before the Philistines? Let's take to ourselves from Shiloh the ark of the covenant of the Lord that it may come among us and deliver us from the power of our enemies. Now I'm going to suggest to you right here at this point, and this is going to inform our study of 1 Chronicles 13, their attitude is not right. They are not living in harmony with God. Because the Lord gave the Philistines the victory. And their first thought is, what have we done wrong to offend the Lord? Their first thought was, we don't have our good luck charm. Clearly, we're missing our super weapon. We did not bring the ark. The the first thought is like, oh, no, clearly God's not angry with us. We just just forgot a piece of equipment. Now, we're going to see in chapter 6, 1 through 2, I'm not going to read it just yet, but in reference to it, that there is rampant idolatry going on in Israel at this time. They were not giving themselves wholly to the Lord. They were not loving the Lord thy God with all their soul, heart, and mind. They, didn't, they weren't questioning their relationship with God, even though that's what they should have been questioning. Their thought was, oh no, we, we, we forgot the lucky ark. Now we go to chapter 5, verses 1 through 6. So they go to Shiloh. They get the ark. Here's what happens. Now the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. So the battle's already done. Philistines take the ark. Then the Philistines took the ark of God and brought it to the house of Dagon and sat before Dagon. And when the Ashadites arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face on the ground before the ark of the Lord. So they took Dagon and set him on his place again. But when they arose early the next morning, behold, Dagon had fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of the Lord. 
and the head of Dagon, and both palms of his hands were cut off from the threshold. Only the trunk of Dagon was left to him. Therefore neither the priests of Dagon, nor all who entered Dagon's house, tread on the threshold of Dagon and Ashdod to this day. So what happens? Israel goes out to battle again with the ark. They lose it. It's not like they're defeated. They lose the ark. Kind of reminds me of the movie Sandlot. You know, they're playing with their baseball. It's their last baseball. They hit it over the fence. And the son, who doesn't know the value of his dad's signed baseball by Babe Ruth, so my dad has one. I'll go, I'll go get the baseball. And we can play baseball all day. And sure enough, the first crack of the bat on that signed Babe Ruth baseball goes over to the fence to that vicious dog. It's basically like the Israelites, oh, no, what are we going to do? We lost the battle. Like, uh, somebody had to have the idea. We'll get the ark. Nothing possibly wrong could go wrong with that. And afterwards, like, oh, now what do we do? We don't have a second ark. We've lost it. And now the Philistines, the people who we hate and are vile idolaters and evil, now they have it. Now the Philistines don't just get to use it however they like. It destroys their idols. It actually later will afflict all those who are near it with tumors and judgment. But like I said earlier, their attitude was not right. They never thought to question their standing before God. Now in chapter 6 of First. Samuel, excuse me, I referenced the wrong thing earlier. Chapter 6 of 1 Samuel is the account of the return of the ark. But we're only going to read the first two verses here. Um, they seek to return it. Now the ark of the Lord had been in the country of the Philistines seven months. And the Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark for the Lord? Tell us, please, how to send it to its place. Um, if you look in verse 12 of chapter 5, it tells them that they were all smitten with tumors, those who came near it. So they obviously, Phil says, we, we don't want this thing anymore. So they finally call Israelites, who again, they hate them just as much as Israelites hate Philistines. So the priest, how do, we, how do we get this out of here? We're tired of the tumors. It keeps on destroying our idols. There's too much trouble. Well, the priest suggested, well, build a, new art, build a new cart and send it back to us, and, and it'll, it'll be good. Now, I want to look in chapter 7 here real quick before we go back to the text. Verses 1 through 4. And the men of Kedron Jerem came and took the ark of the Lord and brought it to the house of Abinadab on the hill and consecrated Eliezer, his son, to keep the ark of the Lord. From that, day on, from that day that the ark remained at that place was, a long, was long, for it was twenty years, and all the house of Israel lamented after the Lord. Then Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you return to the Lord with all your heart, remove the foreign gods and the Asheroth from among you, and direct your hearts to the Lord and serve him alone, and he will deliver you from the hands of the Philistines. So the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Asheroth and served the Lord alone. Now, this is the reason why I say I don't think the Israelites even question that they weren't right with the Lord and why the ark did them no good in the battle. When they lost the first battle, their, their, question, their, their thought was, well, clearly we didn't have the ark. Not that, what are we doing that angered the Lord that he defeated us? Here is the answer of what angered the Lord. They were going after the idols. And it didn't occur to them to think, well, maybe that's a problem. But we're told at this point that when they finally get it back from the Philistines, which they really didn't give it back, the Philistines are like, we're done with this here, take it back. It goes to Abinadab. It doesn't even go back to Shiloh. It goes to Abinadab's house. His, his son is consecrated as a priest to, to minister before it. And the text tells it it stayed there 20 years outside the tabernacle. And we go back to 1 Chronicles 13. We're told that they did not seek the ark the whole reign of Saul. They completely neglected it. I would submit, submit to you that Israel was training the ark like a good luck charm with no regard for their standing before God. Now keep that in mind. Because that's going to underscore what we look in 1 Chronicles 13. Back to 1 Chronicles 13, we're going to see that so David has a desire. We, we need to bring back the Ark of the Covenant. That's a good desire. He wants to restore the tabernacle worship, restore the Ark to its rightful place. 
And one thing I want to know before we move on to the next section of the text. Verse 2 is very telling about this whole situation. This is not the only time David's done this. Um, but we didn't want to note, note this one. He doesn't seek the Lord first. He assembles all the people and then says, if it seems good to you, and if it's from God, let's bring back the ark. There's other times in his life where he seeks the Lord first in order to determine if this is a good thing to do. Nowhere in 1 Chronicles 13, to my memory also, 1 Samuel 6, does anyone go seek the Lord to see if this is a good idea or how to go do it? I say, well, if this is a good idea, let's go do it. Look at verse 5, 5 through 8. So David assembled all Israel together from, the Shil- from Shiloh of, e- uh, sh- sorry, Sheor of Egypt, even to the entrance of Hamath, to bring the ark of God from Kitarath Jerem. David and all Israel went up to Baalah, that is to Kitarath Jerem, which belongs to Judah, to bring, up from the, to bring up from there the ark of God, the Lord who is enthroned above the cherubim, where his name is called. They carried the ark of God in a new cart from the house of Abinadab, and Uzzah and Iho drove the cart. David and all Israel were celebrating before God with all their might, even, the song, even with songs and lyres and harps, tambourines, cymbals, and with trumpets. We're going to continue on, verse 9. When they came to the threshing floor of Chidon, Uzzah put his hand on the hand to hold the ark because the oxen nearly upset it. The anger of the Lord burned against Uzzah, so he struck him down because he put his hand on the ark, and he died there before God. Then David became angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, How can I bring the ark of God home to me? So David did not take the ark with him to the city of David, but took it outside of the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, Thus the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months. And the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with all he had. Shortcuts were taken. There is no less than, well, there's several things that they're violating the law here. And everyone, everyone involved is sinning. It is not just Uzzah. And this is something the New American Standard doesn't really bring out. At least when I read this, was we put his hand out to support the ark. We tend to, we tend to think of a guy as like, the ark's tipping. The Hebrew there actually is more like Uzzah went down and gripped the ark to try and support it. Like he is, his entire body is on the ark. But that's not the only sin. So let's, let's consider what's being violated here. One, the ark is visible. In transportation of the ark, the ark was supposed to be covered by the veil of the tabernacle. The priests were to come in, and we'll cite this in just a minute, the priests were to come in, take down the veil, and cover it, so the assistance of the temple would not be struck dead when they came in to transport it. Numbers chapter 4 in verse 5. That's the text, the main one we want to know, but Numbers chapter 4 in verse 5. We read here, when the camp set, sets out, Aaron and his son shall, shall go in and they shall take down the veil of the screen and cover the ark of testimony with it. And they shall lay a covering, a porpoise skin on it, and shall spread it out with a cloth of pure blue and shall insert its poles. Okay, there's a reason for that. You look down verse 15. When Aaron and his sons had finished covering the holy objects and all the furnishings of the sanctuary, when the campus is set out, after the sons of Koloth shall come and carry them so they will not touch the holy objects and die. These are the things of the tent of meeting which the sons of Koath are to carry. Look in verse 20. But they shall not go in to see the holy objects even for a moment or they will die. So, one... This is a, kind of a theme I'm noticing in my own studies. There's always, there seems to be always a little bit of grace in God's, God's wrath. In that, they all should have died. They're all looking at the ark. God doesn't strike them dead. He suffers with their sin there. Okay, well, that's not the only thing. Ark's not being covered as God commanded now, we're only going to go read Exodus 5, 
but I'm just going to rattle off some scriptures here to impress upon you the point of how many times God spoke about how to carry the ark. Exodus 24, 25, 14 through 15, Exodus 37, verses 4 through 5, Numbers 4, verses 15, Numbers chapter 7, verse 9, Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 9, um, Joshua chapter 3 and verse 3, chapter, uh, chapter 3 and verse 8, chapter 3, verse 13 through 15, chapter 3 and verse 17. God gave plenty of instruction, plenty of instruction about how to carry the ark. And how many times we've, we've said, how many times does God have to command something? Once. Now that which is abundantly important to God, he gives abundant information for he wanted to make sure they got it through their head that this is how you carry the ark. Looking in Exodus chapter 4, 25, verses 14 through 15. In Exodus 25, verses 14 through 15. You shall put poles in the rings in the sides of the ark to carry them with the ark. The poles shall remain in the rings of the ark. They are, shall not be removed from it. Again, the Levites were supposed to come in, or the assistants who were assigned to that were supposed to come in, pick up the ark, and carry it. Not put on a new cart. By the way, back in 1 Samuel 6, the priests, again, it looks like they just conferred among themselves. Excuse me. Um, they come back, and they say, well, we'll come back on the ark. Okay, that was approved. But now here, they should have known what was approved how they should have carried it. But uh, I have the thing that perhaps they, they looked back and maybe thought, you know, that, arc, that, that cart idea is not bad. I like that. Um, it makes our job easier. Some, and they just take the innovation wholesale. Now you look back again, 1 Chronicles 13. Those are the two major areas that the shortcuts were taken. In addition, too, that they couldn't seem to be bothered to insert the poles and carry it as needed. It's not that they're lacking men. The ark is visible. They're not covered. They're touching it. There's another one. It's not being carried as God commanded it. Now, Bob Waldron made a great observation about this whole situation. Uzza tends to be the focal point. I hope it's clear that Uzza is not the only one who's sinning here. Everyone is. Everyone. The question is, well, why is Uzzah the one who gets struck dead? An illustration. It's like an electrical crew. They're wiring a house, and they know they're not doing up to code. They're, taking, they're cutting corners. They're using old wiring that is, that's out of date. It's putting everyone in danger. Everyone's at fault. But it's the man who touches the live, ungrounded wire that dies and suffers the consequences for everybody else's sins, because he's involved in it as well. Uzzah is the man who touches the live wire. And notice, no one in the setting gets all up, upset and goes, well, that's not fair. It's exactly, it, it's similar to what happened with Nadab and Abihu. God gave abundant instructions. And what we're seeing here is what we saw previously when we were looking at 1 Samuel. The people had not the reverence for the ark in the way they ought to. They had reverence for the object of the ark. They thought the ark, well, we need it. It's a good luck charm. It's our super weapon. People will fall before us when we have it. May I suggest to you that they made the ark into an idol. And they failed to understand that the ark represented the absolute, the, the, the holiness and the presence of God himself. And so they all learned real quickly that the Lord's very serious about what he said. He's very serious about any violations of his law. And they learned firsthand what it means to come and fall into the hands of an angry God. But what God did here is just because, again, he gave abundant information. He was patient. Again, they did not all get struck dead when they saw the ark. They did not all get struck dead when they're carrying it wrong. But they needed a concrete lesson, if you will, to impress us upon their minds. Now, David understandably becomes shaken. 
All of us would have. Look in verses 11 and 12. Then David became angry, angry because of the Lord's outburst against Uzzah, and he called that place, a, that place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of God that day, saying, how can I bring the ark of God home to me? So, there's anger at first. Maybe rightfully so, maybe not. Understandable, that's the right word, understandably so. But that's at David's orders that all this is happening. Now, people have their share too. They're complicit in it. They're, they're sharing it. The priests are especially so. But that anger quickly turns into fear. And he's just beside himself. Well, how can I, how can I put the ark in the city of David now? And we may, we may give David some concession. Maybe he's still, he still has a lot of room for growth here. Perhaps he still hasn't gotten the lesson that it's not about the ark, it's about your relationship with God. So, what he does is he drops it off at Obed-Edom's, the Gittite. Now, what's interesting here is David and the people here sin just as they did in Samuel's day. They know the ark would strike strike anyone with tumors of the Philistines. So David's probably thinking, I'm, I'm not going to risk taking this back to Jerusalem, so here's some gun. Here, you take it. But we see a contrast here, at least implicitly, that Obed-Edom and his family had reverence for God. They understood what the ark represented. Not that the ark itself was somehow blessing them. It is the God who made the ark the God whom the ark represents, who blesses them. Again, look here, verse 14, Thus the, God, thus the ark of God remained with the family of Obed-Edom in the house three months, and the Lord blessed the family of Obed-Edom with all that he had. Interesting enough, if you look in the 26th chapter in verse 5, um, the Lord continued to bless Obed-Edom with a strong lineage within the priestly family. Um, oh, verse 5, excuse me. Should be verse um, 8, excuse me. All these were the sons of Obed-Edom. They had their sons and their relatives were able men with strength for service. 62 from Obed-Edom. Again, Obed was richly blessed for his reverence and his respect for God and his things, and he was faithful in his charge over the ark for the three months it was with him. But how do we get the ark back to Jerusalem? We see later that David eventually comes to an understanding of what, 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 what went wrong. Excuse me. In chapter 15, verses, in verse 2, We're told in verse 1, after David had gone away and done some stuff, built some houses, built up Jerusalem a little bit, we see in verse 2, then David said, no one is to carry the ark of God but the Levites, for the Lord chose them to carry the ark of God and to minister him to him forever. You'll look down in verse 13. Because you did not carry it at first, the Lord your God made an outburst on us, for we did not seek him according to the ordinance. I would suggest to you, according to the ordinance, means that David read what the law taught concerning the ark. And at some point when he reads it between the incident of Uzzah and when they bring it back, he realizes we messed up. That God acted justly. And so he lays the blame rightfully. I mean, David's not excusing his own responsibility in this, but he goes to the priest and says, y'all were the ones supposed to carry it. Again, verse 14 here, or 13, excuse me, because you did not carry it first, the Lord our God made an outburst on us. Again, why the priest? Well, they're the literate ones. They're the ones who are supposed to know the law. They're the ones who are supposed to guide the people. To borrow a phrase with, from Uncle Ben in Spider-Man Comics, with great power comes great responsibility. They were the ones who had the power to read, to understand, and they were given the responsibility to make sure the people knew what the law taught. And they failed. 
That whole situation, Obed did not have to die if the priests were doing their job. So not to make this a rapid-fire succession, but because we don't have time to cover all this. So what happens is he gathers the sons of Aaron, Colath, all the divisions of the Levites and Aaron. He gathers them all together and they go get the ark and there's no incident this time. They carry it exactly according to the ordinance and they bring it to Jerusalem. And it's telling. You look in chapter 17. That after David gets the tent, resets up the tabernacle, they do everything according to the ordinance like he said, that then God's covenant with David is formed. David gets it. The ark is not a lucky charm. The ark represents God himself. And the ark is not supposed to be, the ark is not the object of worship, God is. I don't need a relationship with the ark, I need a relationship with God. And so that's why when David dwells in his house in chapter 17, and it's moved within David that's not right, that he dwells in this great palace in God's tabernacle, God does not, God dwells in a tent. So David sets out to build the temple, and while he's not allowed to build it, he is able to gather materials, and his son Solomon builds it. But during that night in chapter 17, God comes to him and forms a covenant with him, in which these great promises are made. Some of these are messianic in nature. But what do we make of this? You know, why, why is this text included in the history of Israel? You know, it, this text has its original understanding, original lesson perhaps, of what the people were supposed to understand. Again, Chronicles, to my best understanding, is written after exile by Ezra. So what is the lesson that post-exile Israel is supposed to take from this? What are they supposed to learn? I believe contextually the first lesson is that God is not a good luck charm that we may use and discard as we please. He demands fierce loyalty from his people because he gives nothing less. God showed himself to be fierce in his word, to his word in, his, in this account. And you can't take shortcuts to loyalty. And I say that, that may have been the contextual lesson for the people in post-exile, but it's a lesson for us today too because we live in a culture of shortcuts and fast tracks. So much of popular preaching today, and I'm probably, and I'll say I'll be guilty of this too, lessons of the three, you know, three steps of spiritual growth or the rapid fire way to improve your prayer life or something like that. But God, like any relationship, it takes time. And you can't make growth happen. You can help it. You can feed it. You can encourage it. But the magic ingredient to all things is time. And maybe making a little bit uncomfortable here this morning. I say this with a smile because I love you all. Taking shortcuts today is, you know, fast and easy communion, for example. Fast and easy worship services. Of skirting in here, and I'm not just talking about only assembly, but this is this is an example. Skirting in here, like right as we're starting, and then I look up in the amen, and phew, you're gone. Trying to get, relying upon what you've already previously known. Trusting that you've done the right things. Taking shortcuts is just resting the fact that, well, I, I trust that we're doing everything right, and well, we you know, we, we did Lord's Supper, I, I, I gave some money in the collection plate, and, you know, I, I, I kind of listened to Brendan today. It's okay. You know, we didn't sing with an instrument. I was baptized at some point. I don't remember when, but I was. Shortcuts to religion, oftentimes, is just relying on somebody else to do all the work for you. Hoping it's going to work out. Or like David showed throughout his life and other aspects, are we taking personal ownership of our faith? Are we actually endeavoring to know what the book teaches? Are we endeavoring to walk day by day with Christ? 
Do we know why? Are, are, we, are we trusting in God for our salvation and the fact that we've done things right here this morning? Or maybe more practical, if, if somebody asked you why we do the things that we do, could you give them a good answer? Could you give them book, chapter, and verse? And our lesson we learned from this section is, you know, Uzzah's death was 100% preventable. If everyone was doing their jobs, Uzzah doesn't die in that incident. Um, now, we don't have a priesthood today, but if you want to turn over to 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, we don't have a priesthood in the way we think of priesthood as in the Old Testament, a separate cast of people. Excuse me, yes. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10. Speaking of the excellencies of redemption and the amazing blessings in Christ, Peter makes this application point. He says, but you, speaking to his audience, all Christians, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for God's own possession. And God doesn't just have us as his own people just so he can put something on a shelf. We know it's going to be redeemed as to sit there. He says next, so that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who has called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. For you were once not a people, but now you are the people of God. You had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Let's invert that. Because we of the people of God have received mercy, because we are now the people of God, we are to proclaim his excellencies and his gospel to all we can because we are his people and his priesthood. So making application from Uzzah. How many spiritual deaths will be prevented? Because if all of us do what we know our duty is to God. And maybe making a negative application. How many spiritual deaths have happened because the people of God have been negligent in their responsibility to Jehovah? And finally, there are no shortcuts in serving God. We didn't dwell too much on this, but David is a great example of when you're confronted with error that you've been guilty of, sin that's in your life, how do you respond? You know, David, many people will start trying to self-justify. They'll start casting blame. We could talk at nauseum about Saul. 1 Samuel 15, that's a great example, where Saul, Saul just, he starts blaming all the people. Well, it's the people who, who did all this wrong, even though he's the king and gave the order. Oh, I, I didn't want to do it. The people made me. No, you did. You did do it. But David, he doesn't start to self-justify. I think you see a little moment where David comes close to engaging in further sin, in that he got angry at the Lord. He almost got there, but it quickly is checked because then it was replaced by fear because he realizes something isn't right here. We messed up. That was a lesson that they didn't learn back in 1 Samuel. So there's no shortcuts of serving God. I'm trying to make it a little bit more practical. If you know you're not living right, you're not growing as much as you could, you're kind of just trusting on what you've always done for your faith, the faith that you're you're relying on a second-hand faith from your family or friends. Resolve today to stop doing that. And I've just embraced them to sound like a broken record on this. You need to start engaging with God. Be a chapter a day from his word, from the Psalms. I would say the Psalms. You know, we sing a song once in a while, How Long Has It Been?, and maybe that's where I want to leave it this morning. How long has it been since you truly felt at ease with God? Since you've actually spent time in prayer with Him? How long has it been since you've lingered over His Word? You've enjoyed the blessings that He gives through the brethren, through the fellowship. How long has it been since you've not feared the Lord, but knew confidently you were walking in harmony with him. You know, I think Uzzah's teaching the, the post-exile people that you, he's basically saying this story, why Uzzah's recording it again. 
we took a lot of shortcuts with God. We gave him leftovers. We, we disrespected him. We showed him no reverence. Make sure this time we don't repeat those same mistakes. You know, we're... Far in, my, in my opinion, the pandemic is pretty much over for me. I'm not diminishing it. I know there's still risks. If you're a person in high-risk category, you know who you are. And you need to be convicted in that and, and take appropriate precautions. I'm not trying to diminish that at all. I was going with someone with that. Oh, for me. I don't want it to go back to 2019. This, for me, that's taking steps backwards growth-wise. I want this next year, I want the rest of this year and 2022 to be a year I, I take God more seriously. I have more delight in his people. I rejoice greater in his blessings. I seek after him in every way possible. To why I'm not taking any shortcuts. A little confession from your preacher here. The reason why I'm switching Bibles, I've had mine only seven years. It, it's fine. But I was finding myself relying too much on its notes. The markings I've done, the notes I've done, the highlights I've done. And I just thought, you know what? Instead of throwing out all my sermons, which I don't want to do, I need a Bible that has no markings, clean slate. I can't rely on anything I've done previously but it's going to force me to grow. And this one, it's not a red letter. So I have to read carefully, is this Jesus speaking or is it not? I can't just gloss over the page anymore. That's one thing I'm doing to make sure I'm not taking shortcuts with God or in the preaching. I'm going to make sure that I'm, I'm going to read this with fresh eyes every single time. And guess what? When this one gets all full of markings, I'll put it on my shelf and grab another one. At this point, I'm rambling. But this morning, if you feel convicted of sin, you, you realize you're not walking right with God, if you have never trusted in the provision of his grace by being obedient to the gospel in the waters of baptism for remission of your sins, you need to do so this morning. We would love to assist you with that. Maybe you've done that in the past, and you're not walking right, or you're struggling spiritually. Um, now is the time to seek the prayers of the congregation. We can pray with you. We can pray for you. We can help you become a child of God this morning. Won't you come? Let's see how we stand and sing the song. It's been selected.